All right, so in this lesson, we're going to look at concurrency conflicts, what they are, and how we can address them. Now, let's just spend some time to understand what we mean by concurrency conflicts. So databases are used concurrently by multiple application instances. And just think about it. In a web application, you have several persons doing several operations against the same database and sometimes even the same data or records. And when they're doing all of this, they're doing it independently of each other, as we've seen with each request, there is a brand new instance of a database connection, and if core is tracking stuff in memory based on that particular request. Now, when two different instances modify the same record simultaneously, that can lead to corruption and inconsistencies in the data. Um, if core assumes that concurrency conflicts are relatively rare, so it uses this technique called optimistic concurrency. So what is optimistic concurrency? It's implemented by conferring a property called a concurrency token on each database record. This token is basically loaded and tracked when a query is performed. And basically it is tracked in the background and it's used to compare. It's like a version control token. So let's think of it like a GUID. If you loaded the record and it had a particular GUID value, and I load the record and it has a particular GUID value, and then you modify the record, it's going to have to update that GUID value because now it's a new version of that record. So when I am going to save my changes, what should happen is that, or what IFCore does is it will make sure it compares the GUID that I loaded versus the GUID that is currently in the database. And if those two clash, then we end up with a DB concurrency issue because clearly I'm not updating the same version of the record. Now SQL Server implements row version to check for record versions. And that is almost an innate feature that SQL Server has. Not every database engine has it. So SQLite for instance does not have it. So we would have to do that from application code where every time we update the record, we actually update the version manually. And then that check can happen later on by EF Core's standards. So this is optimistic concurrency. Now you do have this concept called pessimistic concurrency, and we're not that is kind of out of the scope of this course, but I just thought it would be good to mention it so that you have both scenarios. So pessimistic concurrency means that I will write my application code in such a way that I actually lock the record while an operation is being performed. That way I can ensure that the database will, or at least the application, will definitely not do something with that record. Or rather, when somebody else is trying to access that record while it's locked, that will just fail. So I can ensure that only one person at a time will ever access this record. Uh, generally, this is done using a lock object or a semaphore slim object if you're doing asynchronous operations. So now that we have an overview of how concurrency conflicts work what exactly they are let us jump over to our code and look at how we can write our code and configure our database to use these fail safes so the first modification that we're going to make is to our teams model and what i'm going to do here is introduce a new column i'm going to make it a timestamp so a timestamp is an excellent way to determine the time something happened or determine a version and i'm going to make this a byte array column so that it will go in the database as the row version. Now, once again, row version is kind of unique to SQL Server. And timestamp here will map to the SQL Server row version column. So this will be automatically generated and it is a very minimal effort um, type of way to introduce a concurrency token. Now, in addition to doing this, or an alternative to doing it this way would be that we could jump over to the team configuration if we wanted to use the Fluent API. And I could say builder.property and put on the property for version that we just introduced. And then I'm going to specify that version is row version. There we go. So that is an alternative way to setting up that concurrency um column concurrency token column rather or just having it map to the sql server row version column 
Now for SQL Server, all you would have to do is run your migration and it would update and everything would be set. So I'm, I'm going to comment this out because this is for SQL Server only. So if you're using SQL Server, feel free to proceed with that one. And I'll put that same flag over the Fluent API configuration. So I'll just comment this out. So that's for SQL Server only. Now, if you're using like SQLite or maybe another database engine that does not inherently support it, then I can use a GUID instead of that byte array. So what I'm going to do here is use the concurrency check annotation, and I'm going to have a public GUID, and I'm still going to call it version. And this could alternatively be configured in our configuration file, similar to this, except it would be, uh, sorry, let me uncomment this. Instead of is row version, I would use is concurrency token. So this is an alternative to this if we're not using our SQL server. Now, having configured that as the concurrency token, and I'll proceed with this one where we're doing it manually, but that's fine. I can in code, so let's jump over to the code now. Let me just save all those changes. And in code, let us say that I have a team. So I'm going to load var team is equal to context.teams.first or find, let me just find the one with the ID of one. So after I have found that particular team, let's say I update the team dot name. I remember that when we find tracking is automatically enabled, so I don't have to go through much fanciness here. So I'm just going to update the name to new team uh, with concurrency, concurrency check. So I'm making a change here, but then because we're using our own concurrency token, we are going to have to update the version here as well. And that's easy enough. It's a GUID, so we just have to say GUID is equal to, or sorry, GUID.newGUID. So we just generate a new GUID, and then we can context.save changes. And that's how simple it can be, just to make sure that the version will always change every time we're about to save changes. Now, considering what we're trying to achieve here, you probably wouldn't want to only implement that on team. You would want to do that on every single uh, domain type, every single table that you have. So what we can do is instead of making version only on one table, I can take this and place it in the base domain model. So now every table will inherit that concurrency check column. And then instead of manually changing it every time I'm changing or creating or modifying some record here, I can actually do that in the save changes. So now because we have that column as a part of the base domain model, I can make sure that anything that's being modified or added will now have that update. So in the for each entry, I'm going to also state that entry dot entity dot version gets updated to good dot new good. There we go. So every time we save changes, we make sure that we have the latest version of whatever. So before I move forward, I'm going to just do a migration and update database. So let's jump over to our terminal and add migration, added version uh, token, version token. And the context here is the football league DB context. Let that run. And you'll see here that that new version column is being added to each table. So of course, I'll just go ahead and update the database as we know and update the appropriate context, which is football league DB context. Now I'm going to simulate a DB concurrency error and just jump over to the team's controller and go to the put team method. And you'd see where this scenario is actually being handled in a similar manner. So we put team, we get it, we mark it as modified, and then it's checking to make sure there is no DB update concurrency exception. Notice the save changes is inside of the try. So we're going to do something like that. I'm just going to copy that exception and let's jump over here. First of all, this has to be await save changes async. 
was because we overrode the save changes async so it has to be asynchronously that we do that but we are going to wrap this in a try catch so you can just write try and then press tab twice and it will generate that stub for you and then we're going to catch that db update exception and then i'll just do a console dot right line where i'm going to print that exception message should we get one now in this catch section is where you would handle any application logic that you want to carry out maybe you would update send back a message to the ui to say hey you know um please try the update again because the version you're updating is the old version whatever the error message is but that's why you would catch this specific type of exception so you can handle it in a very specific manner accordingly so we're going to make our save changes happen inside of the try and what i'm going to do is set a breakpoint right above that save changes before it happens, let me just take out this throw. So what we're going to do is let EF Core load the record, make a change. Then we're going to go directly in the database and update the value that's there to something else. And then we're going to allow it to try to save changes and then see what happens, see what kind of error we get. So let us run the console with debugging enabled. And I have, uh, let me try that again. All right, so we loaded team. And we're modifying the name and notice that the version is on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So I have a sample GUID here. I just went online and generated a GUID. So I'm going to jump over to the teams table in my database management system and manually update that GUID. So let us say that there was another operation and with this I have to save, there we go. So let us say that there was another operation that did something and generated a new GUID since this team was loaded into memory and it still has its 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 version. So when I click continue, it's going to run, but let's look back at the console window and we'll see here that the console is writing out the DB exception message. So it hit the catch and the message was the database operation was expected to affect one row, but actually affected zero. Data may, not, may have been modified or deleted since entities were loaded. So this is a very important bit of reading for us. And this article from Microsoft documentation actually sums up what this lesson is talking about. It also has some great tips on how you can handle the exception when it does occur. So that is how we can prevent database update concurrency exceptions, or at least handle them because, well, they may happen, but it's good to know how we can create our database in a manner that we can detect them and handle them properly. So that's it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you find some practical use for this concept.